This chapter is about the beautiful age, la belle époque. Okay, this is the beautiful age, the beautiful era. This is a time where you have relative peace between the uh, the end of the Franco-Prussian War in 1871, the last war of unification of Germany, and then the outbreak of World War One on the large scale in 1914 in Europe. So again, it's known as the beautiful age. So one thing we, we need to talk about with this period between 1871 and 1914, there's so many things going on, so I try to cut it down. But we have to understand that liberalism, that's something we've already talked about. I mean, things like the Decemberist Revolt and others, some of the other things, Carbonari, Unification of Germany and all those other things, they were all influenced by liberalism. So let's, let's look at these first, the political trends. And there's three big ones. So liberalism, we've talked about, and the ideas in liberalism, again, are, are going to be things in the 19th century, such as, for example, um, they're going to support laissez-faire capitalism. They're going to, remember, we, we bring up Adam Smith quite a lot in this class because he's so very important. So in classical liberalism, in, in 19th century liberalism, he believes, of course, that not only are we talking about just having a smaller government and having the government staying out of, of the economy as far as that goes, but he's going to recognize the importance of the labor and the workers, and you're going to see that Adam Smith is um, going to be a, a big influence for the liberals of the 18th century. Now, part of what he writes about and what part of what he espouses that goes down and, and really becomes part of classic liberal um, 19th century ideas is the fact that everybody should be able to have their own economic self-interest and they should be able to pursue their own economic self-interest. So again, repeatedly over and over that you're going to have a small government, you're going to have individual rights, you're going to have the only services that the government will give to the citizens are things that cannot be actually given or provided by an open market, okay? And you're going to see that that those are really, you know, almost, I don't know, in many ways, those are going to be a reactionary way of thinking in some cases because we have laissez-faire again going completely against British mercantilism, which controlled the import, export, all sorts of things over in Great Britain. But the core beliefs of the classical liberals, they're, they're not necessarily going to include things like specifically saying, you know, democracy or whatever. But it does include things like private property. And you're, you'll, um, you're, you're going to see many different influences. As I said, Adam Smith to me, is one of the big ones. But there's a few others that are going to have different influence on, in, in their own ways. Even remember John Locke, who we've talked about back in the Enlightenment, of course, he was also a guy that gave them some of their core ideas, really. If you go back and you look at this, there's going to be ideas of in Locke the consent of the governed and the rule of law and things like toleration of your religion and, and all these things. He's also the one among others, but he's one of the ones, John Locke, who believes that when man is born, you know, when, human, when, when a human's born, we are all free and equal. So again, a lot of this is enlightenment ideas but that's a big deal in the 19th century as they embrace liberalism. That was a big movement. Now, we also have revisionist Marxism. Now, if you recall, we went through Marxism. We had 
all these different tenets of Marxism and the dialectic and all that, and it's the economy stupid and, and everything about Marxism. Remember, Karl Marx is writing back in the earlier 1800s. He's writing much closer to the early industrial revolution. So what happens over time is Marxism gets changed. Because remember, Karl Marx and Engels, they're going to say eventually the workers, the proletariat, are going to get so tired of being treated badly and being used by the, by the capitalists, by the owners of the factories and, and the wealthy, that the proletariat, the workers, are going to have a violent revolution. They're going to kill the capitalists, they're going to take over, and there's going to be no social classes. And then they would evolve into what Marx called a more, well, he called it a more evolved form of socialism called communism. Okay, now, wait a minute. He was writing, again, back when things were really bad in the earlier Industrial Revolution where the, the workers didn't really have any rights and the conditions were horrific and just everything that we've talked about with early Industrial Revolution. What happens is they go through the 19th century. They're going through, heading toward the 20th century. And by the end here, in the era that we call the beautiful age, La Belle, La Belle Epoque, well, the Marxists realize that maybe revolution is not inevitable. Maybe this idea that Karl Marx was able to look at the patterns of history and see that there were always these two groups in conflict, and right at that moment, it was the workers versus the capitalist. Well, you know, that wasn't really panning out because they couldn't see what was coming in the future, as no one can. So revisionist Marxism is going to be where they change the original ideas of Karl Marx from there must be, and it is inevitable that we will have, a violent, bloody revolution. The revisionist Marxist, writing later, as things got a little better, said, well, maybe not a bloody revolution. Probably what will happen is Marxism will take over and it will be through evolution, through growth, through change as people adapt to it and, and embrace it and all of that. Now, why did they do that? Well, as I said, Marx was writing in a really, really dark period of the Industrial Revolution and then as you get closer into the, um, to the 20th century, you have two big things that he didn't know would happen and that the revisionists are going to watch happening. We're going to see the expansion of the middle class. Now remember, earlier Industrial Revolution, the workers really are, I mean, their lives are horrific in so many ways. We've talked about that. But there was the huge wage gap between the wealthy and poverty, okay? The poverty-stricken, way down here, living lives of, you know, of quiet desperation, as they say. But then you had the wealthy, the owners, and the people who were, who were doing well, and, and never the two should meet. So, Karl Marx believed that eventually, eh, violence is going to ensue. Well, in reality... The middle class became a thing, okay? The middle class grew. The middle class got stronger. And the factories started to have laws. There, there, there were laws. I mean, really, we mentioned briefly when I talked about the Triangle Factory Fire, I hope pretty briefly, in 1911 over in, in the United States. That's going to be one thing that happens in America that's going to start to really make the legal system look at the way the workers were being treated and laws were going to come out. And the same thing's happening over in Europe. We're going to have new laws to protect the workers. And we're going to have a group that rises up that are going to be not the factory workers out on the floor. They're going to be the managers and those kind of guys. They're going to rise up into a middle class. And in the middle class, remember, you're going to see your lawyers and doctors and, and all of that. 
And so the middle class is going to grow as more people end up in that particular designation. Now, the big thing Karl Marx could never have seen was the rise of nationalism. Okay, now we, we have the whole chapter of nationalism and real politic. And to me, again, nationalism being this very rabid patriotism, my country right or wrong. Well, Karl Marx was the guy who had said working men of the world unite or workers of the world unite. Because remember, he said you would have more in common with a worker from another country if you were a worker than you would ever have with an upper class man from your own country. Now, nationalism would say, oh, no, no, no. I am a Frenchman, therefore, you know, all Frenchmen. So he didn't see that coming. And the revisionists, they watched it happen. So they had to actually revise original Marxism to meet what was actually happening at the time to make it still relevant. Anarchism. This is the third of the major political trends of the time. Anarchism basically believes that all government is oppressive. And this is something that really took hold more in the, um, the countries that were not really based on democratic principles. And in the beginning, you're not going to see the anarchist calling for a lot of, of things like assassinations and that type of thing. And that's going to come later. But as things got worse, you're going to see several assassinations that the anarchists are going to believe were actually um, justifiable. Because if you believe that government itself, just the existence of government is oppressive to the people, and you believe that you can assassinate the president or in some cases the czar or a king, or whatever. If you could assassinate, kill someone who's at the head of the government, and you think that could make the government fall, and then you truly believe that the government being gone is a good thing, then, you know, the idea for them was not that they were committing acts of, of terror, but the idea was the anarchists are going to be facing such terrible conditions in many places in Europe and uh, even in the United States, we're going to see some of this when we had the assassination in 1901 by a, well, Leon Cholgosh, who claimed he was an anarchist, but he's going to assassinate William McKinley in 1901. And you're going to see the government getting very... Um, well, I guess to use their word, oppressive, because as the Industrial Revolution was rolling on in the 1800s, the labor unions were starting to form. And so the government didn't like that, and the government would come in, in Europe and the United States, government would come in and, and, and break the strikes, and they would be on the side of the corporations, the businesses. So you're going to end up with the assassination of Tsar Alexander II, as one of the other, you know, examples of, of uh, anarchism and, and wanting to get rid of the government completely. Now, that doesn't work because just because you kill the guy at the top, that doesn't mean your entire country is going to fall apart. And you have a guy named Michael Bakunin in, uh, in Russia. And I always think for some reason of the TV show Lost because Michael Bakunin was actually a character just like John Locke and just like Rousseau. They used those names. They weren't, they weren't really particularly based on the actual characters, or the actual people, rather. But Michael Bakunin, or Mikhail, he was Russian, um, Michael Bakunin is going to be one of the most important anarchists of the 19th century. And his ideas are, well... I don't know. I feel like sometimes we overuse the word revolution, you know, French revolution, industrial revolution, uh, digital revolution or whatever. But I mean, Bakunin is going to be a real ideologue. He's going to have ideas and he wants to get out there and he wants to promote these ideas. 
So he had written a lot of works, and he had um, he had actually known Karl Marx, and Karl Marx and and um, Michael Bakun. Sorry, I still have a sore throat. I'm sorry, you guys. I keep saying that as I'm as I'm snorting and swallowing and, and trying to take drinks of things to make my throat not hurt. But anyway, Karl Marx and Michael Bakun, in the way uh, to my understanding, they're going to have kind of a of a you know rough relationship, and Karl Marx, of course, he wants socialism. I mean, I, Marx is socialism. Bakunin though says, you know, we really don't need to have a bigger government. What we need is no government. We need to have communes, okay? Communes because that means you're going to have the people ruling themselves in these smaller groups and, and all of that type of stuff. So he and Marx, you know, Karl Marx, they did have a, um, you know, they, they did have a, a, a history of having very different ideas and not particularly getting along very well. So anyway, anarchism. One really cool thing that I like as a, as a humanities person is the arts during the period of La Belle Epoque because the arts are going to be so, there's going to be so much variety and so many great works of art that are going to come out during this time. So we'll start by just you know, mentioning a couple of things here. First of all, in terms of literature, you're going to have realism. Now, realism is going to be where you're exploring like real human emotions, you know, fear and longing. You're going to have depression. You're going to have the, the, the things that are not romanticized. You're going to actually try in realism to look deeply into humanity, into our psyche, and have accurate characters that are realistic, okay? Hence, realism. So it's not going to be idealized and everything's not going to work out well in the end. And it's going to be like real life. So a couple of my favorites, really. I love the, um, the Russians, Tolstoy and Dostoevsky. Um, Tolstoy, War and Peace, great, um, you know, great epic novel. And Crime and Punishment, that's Dostoevsky's probably masterpiece. Um, I, like, I like a lot of their short stories, too. And if we were in class in person, we could we could talk a little bit more about some of their short stories. But you know, in the interest of time, in the interest of of um, trying to shorten what you need to know for for a quiz or an exam or anything, um, I, I, yeah, I would like for you to know, be familiar with Tolstoy, War and Peace, and Dostoevsky and Crime and Punishment. Although I would probably never ask you to spell uh, his name. Now, Thomas Hardy. We also have Thomas Hardy as a good example with his book, Return of the Native. That's an important work. So Return of the Native, again, a great example of realism, is going to have some wonderful characters as far as, you know, we're looking at realism and some, some things that really happen in life. So we're going to have, um, I guess, the, the main female character is going to have a, a lot and you've got a lot of, of sexual relationships that you didn't really see in, you know, portrayed in this manner without quite so much judgment, uh, you know, as far as that goes. And, and all the different kinds of, of demands on people during that period. So you're going to have this, this novel standing out and and um, if you've ever read it, you, you know kind of what I'm talking about. If you haven't read it, uh, it's it, realism is kind of a, a thing that you have to understand going in that it's going to be, sometimes it gets really intense. And so Return of the Native is a classic example of that as well. Although I have to admit, I still very much favor Dostoevsky and Tolstoy, but there's many, many others. I was a teenager and a um, 
a thriving artist at the time. I actually made some extra money doing portraits and all kinds of stuff when I was in high school and really wanted to be an artist. But, um, you know, things, things kind of changed and, uh, you know, went a different direction. But I still have my love for art and, and my favorite painting style has always been Impressionism since, since I was a teenager. So Impressionism was a movement that started in the 19th century, and it's very, um, it's very distinctive in many ways because what they're going to do is they're going to take a lot of times the subjects out into the world. Instead of having your model pose in a room for you and deal with things like still life, they're going to go out and paint regular things. They're going to go out and they're going to paint things that they see in the real world. So they take it out of the studio and into the, into the real world, and they're going to use their brushes very wildly sometimes, very freely. And it's going to be, to me, the thing that I always liked about it is, is they have this feel of motion and, and time. So a lot of it emphasizes the effects of sunlight, and that comes again from being out of the studio. So we see the public at first, you know, in some cases, they thought it was very strange because you got to understand in the 1800s and before that, you, you wanted usually to paint and draw pictures that were fairly realistic for, for the most part, not all the time, but for the most part, right? So once we had photography and we had, had really improved on photography, then people looked at the, what the Impressionists were doing and they were like, wow, um, what exactly is this? So it, it's going to start somewhere back in the, in the 1800s. And you're going to see again the effects of, of motion in those pictures. The fact that you don't have to make everything completely realistic. You're, you're going for, in some ways, more of a feeling and time and light and so many of those other things. And, and I love most of, um, of the Impressionists very much so because they can see things in a way that is, is totally different from just taking a picture or trying to imitate what you see. I mean, they're gonna, they're not really gonna use, most of them anyway, are not really gonna use a lot of pure white or pure black in Impressionism. So they're going to have, say, a white canvas, and if they wanna leave something white, then they're gonna leave that part of the canvas white. So they're gonna be really, um, they're gonna be painting at a time where this experimental, like this, this experimental feeling among the Impressionist painters is going to pay off because after people first were taken aback at what they were doing, it really caught on. And in some ways, they started to go a lot brighter with their colors. Now, my favorite of the Impressionist painters is Pierre Auguste Renoir. He, he does a lot of portraits. There's Monet, who paints tons of water lilies. We'll see a picture by him in a second. There's Manet, who's known for landscapes. And so many others. So many others. So, let's look at a couple of those pictures. Slide number six has one of my, um, one of my favorite paintings by my favorite artist of... The Impressionist, actually probably my favorite painter of all time, really, um, Pierre Auguste Renoir, and he's painting the boating party. And I've seen that. I got to see that in person, and it's magnificent in person. But this is a really this is a really interesting thing. If you study a little bit about that painting, you find that it's his friends and people he knows that 
he, he's out, you know, with them and, and you can actually name most of these people. You can kind of at least pick out who they are. And the woman over there sitting on the left with the dog is, I believe, going to be his future wife. He's going to end up marrying her at some point. And we've got, again, this is out, um, you know, having people, you're outside the studio having people do just regular things. And that's very interesting to many of the impressionists. But look in the background, too, as far as the effects of light, the things that are closer to you, you see some detail, like the, the grapes on the table and the wine bottles and that type of thing. But then you look back in, and say the t-shirt or the, well, the tank top that the guy's wearing, the guy that's standing there leaning back behind the, the woman with the dog. And you see that the, you know, the detail's not really strong on his shirt. And then you go back, you look back, and you see trees and, you know, way out in the, in the distance, you see a boat and, you know, a sailboat. And you notice that it's, it's all this, this matter of how the light plays. And again, I'm not an art teacher. I have a, a background in art. But as far as this goes, I mean, this is going to be, I believe, a, a fantastic painting that he, he seems, from what, from what I remember, he seems to have been, you know, out with these people and just sort of decided to paint what he saw. And it gives you a brief impression of what he was seeing at that moment. And that's one reason I love the, um, I love the, the sort of just capture of those fleeting moments that Impressionism does generally give. Slide number seven, we've got an example of Manet, and um, he's, he's also a vital part of all of this story with Impressionism. And this is going to be a guy who had, he, he sort of, he painted realism, and he started looking in, in a different way, and he had his own vision, and he's going to end up being a very strong inspiration for the Impressionists. So he, he sometimes, he's, I've read a lot of books where they, they call him an Impressionist and they call him sometimes a, a pre-Impressionist and there's all sorts of distinctions in there. But anyway, he's going to have definitely a style that influences those that, that see his style, the artists that see his style. And some of his paintings are very much, you know, in the realistic manner, but a lot of them are going to be set, again, outside the studio. Regular people, just social things where people are um, at the races or something like that. That was one of, his, one of his favorite paintings, or one of his favorite, but one of his famous paintings was um, called the races uh, somewhere with the races at somewhere. Um, but you're gonna see that he's gonna have his own way of doing things. and that's that's the key is if people continue doing the same old things, then it's not going to be anything groundbreaking. So Manet, he, he's gonna go out, you know, again, out of the studio on the streets of Paris, and he's gonna, find real people, real things to paint. So it's really, you know, it's really interesting. He's going to do a lot of things outside, but he's he's going to do not as much of the, as I said earlier, landscape, but in thinking about it, I think Manet is more interested in, um, in studies of different things other than just say nature, he, he's going to be interested very much in people. And again, he's going to be extraordinarily inspirational to the Impressionist. So we have Edward Manet, now we've got Claude Monet. And these are not in any sort of chronological order in terms of, of when these people painted them. But Claude Monet is going to be one of the founders of Impressionism, along with Renoir and some of the others. But he 
he's going to be a guy who becomes known for painting many, many different pictures, you know, paintings of water lilies. And he's going to have this really, he's again, one of the founders, and he's going to have this really unique style that really, um, I guess, can easily, if you just looked at one of his pictures, you can see what is meant by Impressionism because he's going to paint a picture called Impression Sunrise and it's going to be beautiful and it's going to be different and it's going to be in the first Impressionist art exhibit that happened in the 1870s. And so because of that title, there was an art critic who coined the term Impressionism for that type of painting. Now, the art critic didn't like it. He meant it to be a, an insult. But Monet and some of the others, they kind of liked it. So they took that and ran with it. And so we have the, the true birth of Impressionism with that particular painting. Characteristics of this period. I'm just going to, you know, I pick some, but one of them is increased materialism. This is a period where we start to see the standard of living, remember, going up for the middle classes, and you also at the same time have the, the goods that are mass-produced being a lot less expensive, so people are going to want and, and be afford to buy or be able to afford to buy and purchase more goods. So add to that the, um, the advertising industry that's going to be out there basically convincing you to purchase, you know, buy new things all the time. So we have a lot of materialism. We're also going to have an increase in European population due to some better hygiene and due to some, some medical um, discoveries over this period. We're going to see that the, the life expectancy is going up a little bit. And so we're going to have more people in Europe. The growth of the cities and the growth of the cities and the life in the cities is going to be really important. See, people are going to come into the cities because that's where a lot of the jobs are. So more families are going to move into the cities and that, you know, those cities are going to grow so quickly that sometimes it's hard to, to, um, to control the growth of the cities. Just like we had seen earlier at several different points of time, this is really, again, the second wave we're gonna talk about of the Industrial Revolution. And we end up with things like, again, the middle class getting in a much better position where, for example, in England, between, say, about 1850 and the late 1890s, the salaries that the workers are making are going to increase by as much as 60%. Imagine that, that's, that's remarkable. Because you also take with that, the prices of goods are gonna actually decrease. So, wow, okay, you, you definitely have the middle class being in a very good position during the second wave of the Industrial Revolution. So you have a lot of people going into the cities and creating their own cultures. And there's a migration from Europe. You're going to have it at roughly, you know, from about 1850 to about 1940-ish, 60 million people are going to leave Europe. They're going to go to all kinds of places besides the United States. But we're going to have that enormous growth in the United States of somewhere from 25 to 27 million people, immigrants coming in to the United States in that period of time. And that's going to be a different, usually in that era, you're going to see people coming from the Eastern European countries. People are coming from more, you know, places like Russia and Poland and the Slavic countries. And a lot of the people who come into the United States at that time are going to be uneducated and they're going to be peasant farmers from places in Europe. They're going to, they're going to have different customs and and they're going to have different 
um, religious values and different things that, that set them apart from some of the earlier immigrants in large numbers that had come to the United States before. So the migration from Europe, the way it affects Europe again, is you've got people leaving, going to other places to start over. And part of that has to do, again, with just simply the fact that the farmers have come up with new, more efficient ways to farm. And you don't need everybody to live on the farm in order to produce the same crops that you were able to produce before. If you if you get down and you look at the at the micro aspects of some of that, you're going to find that in in their old countries, you know, which is what they you know when they came to the United States, you're going to have them refer back to the old country or whatever. But when you have this um, this this immigration, a lot of the people are coming from Europe because of things like famine. And there's going to be um, land and job shortages. And, and as I said, everybody's not needed on the farm. So a lot of young men are going to strike out on their own. So again, we label this period also the time of the second wave or the second industrial revolution. Okay, so the second wave is going to be different because of the technology that it involves. As we talk about the second wave of the Industrial Revolution hitting, we're talking about a change from, say, in the earlier days, steam, steam power, to electricity. We're going to have the internal combustion and diesel engines, and we're going to have cars, planes, and submarines. In addition to, you know, from the first Industrial Revolution, we're going to end up first with, with trains. But now we're going to see more modern-looking things. Again, internal combustion, diesel cars, planes, submarines, all of that brings us into a brand new way of looking at our world. The, um, the second industrial revolution, it, it bleeds over into slide number 10, but characteristic number five, the second industrial revolution, you have to mention Great Britain, the, the workshop of the world or the world's industrial workshop. And eventually the United States is going to overtake Great Britain and, and become the workshop of the world in industry. But Great Britain is where the Industrial Revolution started in the 1700s, and they're, they're going to have, you know, a, a, a head start in some ways. And one thing we see here is corporations are going to become powerful and popular. If you're an owner, let's say you're a guy, you want to start a factory, okay? You're not going to have as much money to invest in something like a factory that that would be that would require a lot of capital, a lot of 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 startup. You're not going to have as much money if you do that on your own. So maybe you get with some of your friends, and maybe you guys still you're well off, but maybe you're thinking, you know, huh? I wonder how we could how we could make this even better. We just even all of us together don't have unlimited amount of money. So one thing that comes about somewhere, it's not a brand new idea during this time, but it's really going to hit, uh, it's going to hit a high point. The corporations are going to start having limited liability. What's going to be unique about this is if you invested in a business, just you and your friends, and that business failed, okay, you could be held liable for any debts that your business owed. They could come and take your house or whatever, your property, to pay your debts from your business. However, if you incorporate as a limited liability corporation, okay, and you sell, well, part of that is also going to be selling stock to people because if you, if you sell stock, people can invest money and in return, they get a share in your business. Now, if the business goes down, the business fails, 
then all of the investors, all of you, are only going to be held accountable for the amount of money you invested. So if you put $50,000 into that corporation and it bombs, they can't come after you for any debts. So limited li liability is going to be a great enticement for a lot of middle class people to want to start investing in stocks. And that's going to be a really big thing in the United States by you know, turn of the century and a little bit later and, and you know leading up to the Great Depression. You're going to see a lot of investment in the corporations through the stock market. And of course, mass production, which I've mentioned already, you know, 15 times probably as I'm talking on this slideshow. we come to number six characteristic of La Belle Epoque, and it's faith in science alone. So people are getting less religious over time, and they start to depend more on science. So by this time, by the, you know, by the time of 1871 to 1914, we have a lot of what we call new wonders of daily life. Now, science, first of all, science is at the core of industrialization, the technology that gave us manufacturing and mass producing all these goods. That was science, creating these machines and so on. And they can see that. There were also a lot of things that helped with your, um, well, it, it helped kind of change your perspective on the world as they as these these new wonders emerged you had a lot of of great brilliant inventors during this time who are going to give us so many different creative ways in um, in things like communication transportation and others so what are some of the new wonders of daily life that would be things that people knew about not necessarily things they had or necessarily things that maybe even they had seen, but a lot of times it, it was things they had heard about. So, of course, we're going to have the, the automobile, which is going to come up, um, you know, fairly, fairly quickly. Um, for a while, I mean, when the, the automobiles were being sold, it was pretty much just the very wealthy. And then you're going to start to see a change. You're going to have bicycles being popular for some, you know, at some point in there, bicycles are going to start to get really, really popular. It's like almost a fad in the 1890s. And a lot of women are going to start riding bikes. And it, it, again, you imagine the clothing that a lot of the women wore during that period you're going to have the long skirts, and so that was kind of a, a challenge, and you had some fashion that started to change as far as that goes. Um, the telegraph had been around, but now the telephone's going to come about here in this period in the late 1800s, and the telephone is going to be, I mean, one of the, the most, I think, um, one of the most important things that's ever been invented to add to the to the changes that give us the modern world today. Because, I mean, this is a communication device that is, we can't imagine not having that ability to communicate with each other from a distance. So that, that was a, a magical thing to people at that time. The electric lights, so we've got electricity and we're starting to use it more for things in people's houses. now. Unless you were pretty wealthy, you're, you're probably not going to have, in the late 1800s, you're probably not going to have electricity in your own home. But you are going to hear about it, and it is going to be in a lot of buildings and, and places, you know, out in the cities. And you're going to have some other really cool things going on, like movies, okay? Motion pictures are going to be actually... Um, they're going to be actually starting somewhere in the, in the late 1800s, 1890s-ish. And a lot, of, um, a lot of, of the picture, the moving pictures back then, 
they were going to be reenactments of things and and there were you know there were there were a lot of people from the period of the late 1890s up until the 1920s who were going to be acting in in silent motion pictures which again i i like silent movies that are comedies comedies there, there's a lot of action in the comedies and so on but this is something that became really it, it was one of the new things that that science you know had given them you're going to have um airplanes airplanes by in this period la belle epoch you're going to have airplanes being um a new thing most people would not have ever ridden in one it was still in this in this um stage where they were perfecting it but you're also going to have by the early 1900s you're going to have helicopters so Again, we could go on and on and on and on about all these new wonders, but this led them to really trust in science. Now, I mentioned earlier that there was a, a big population growth in Europe, and part of that has to do with the germ theory of disease. Okay, and I talk a lot about that in, in, in some of my classes in American history. We go a little bit more into that sometimes. But you're going to have the doctors and the scientists finally starting to understand that there is something that they call germs in general that is too small to see with your eye. Okay, too small to see without magnification. We end up with microscopes, right? And that they can get into our bodies and they can cause harm. Okay, you're going to have the field of bacteriology that's gonna come out and study, of course, bacteria. Now we know that the one way that we can fight a bacterial infection, if you go to the doctor and you have, say, a bacterial infection, that's where they're gonna give you usually antibiotics. So the field of bacteriology and accepting of the germ theory of disease and, and working toward figuring that out is gonna also contribute to the population growth you have Louis Pasteur, Louis Pasteur from, from France. He's going to be a very, very important, um, he's going to be a kind of a, a milestone that we're reaching because he's going to do so many things. Now, Louis Pasteur is going to be from France and he's going to, he's going to develop, I mean, he, he's going to have the process of pasteurization. This is where you're going to have um, this is where you're going to have the pathogens, the things that could harm us, eliminated, and things like water and, and milk and, and some things where you're, where you're actually deactivating some of the, the, the harmful things and allowing it to have a longer lasting shelf life. That's really important. If you can imagine life without that. He's also going to develop a rabies vaccine. Now, when I was a kid, that was the thing we talked about so much. When we talked about Pasteur, we talked a lot about the rabies vaccine and how he tested that and, and so on. And what a, a, you know, again, a milestone that was. You're also going to have uh, Madame Curie, Madame Marie Curie, and she's going to be absolutely amazing. And she's going to be the most famous female scientist still to this day. I mean, she's, she's right up there. She's going to end up winning several important things like Nobel Prize at least twice. She won it for chemistry once and she won it for, for, um, for um, physics at one point in time. And she was a, uh, she was a woman who became um, again, it, she's still, again, right there at the very top, but she became famous for helping develop this theory of what she called radioactivity. Now, she's going to be discovering things, including radium, and if you know, I, I have a science background, and I, I know enough to be dangerous, really, but I do love science, but, but radium's a chemical element, and it's going to be something that reacts with nitrogen instead of oxygen and, and so on. And she's able to discover that. And she's going to give us basically 
the technology we need during World War I, we're going to be able to have x-rays and, and provide x-rays during World War I. We're going to be able to provide those out to the hospitals that are set up near, you know, where the, where the battles are. So it's going to be, I mean, this is an amazing time to be alive. So they're starting to really depend on science. Now, another thing that it contributed here was much earlier, okay? It was, well, I mean, the descent of man is not much earlier. It's actually right there on the cusp, right, as, as La Belle Epoque begins. But Charles Darwin, one of the most misunderstood guys ever, because if you ask someone about evolution and they don't really have a science background, you might hear these remarks that make my, my, my hair stand on end. Well, I didn't come from no ape, you know. Or, oh, the question that used to get me in trouble on Twitter all the time. If someone would ask a, uh, one of, and this is so much more typical than you'd ever believe, but the question would be like, well, if we came from apes, why are there still apes? And I'm just like, oh, dear, I, I just, I can't, I can't. So let me tell you, Charles Darwin did not say, oh, well, you know what? We, we descended from apes. I mean, I've got a little, little comic there of Charles Darwin represented as, you know, part eight, part man, that's not what he's talking about with evolution. And also, again, the idea of, of the theory of evolution had some people saying, and still to this day saying, that, well, it's just a theory. Well, that's, that's a scientific theory, which is very different from saying, you know, I've got a theory about why my dog is over there um, scratching at the door. Yeah, I, okay. A scientific theory, and if you don't have a science background, look up what a scientific theory is, and it might be surprising. But what Charles Darwin is actually saying is if you go back far enough, we have a common ancestor. So I think the problem is if I ask people if they've ever read um, Origin of Species or The Descent of Man, usually the answer is no. I'm like, okay, so how do you know what Darwin said if you didn't read. Well, somebody told me. I'm like, <sighs> okay. <laughs> so a lot of what most people think they know about Darwin is very, very wrong. And there's a lot of things that, that I can, you know, just make really fast, as fast as I can make them. But his book um, on the origin of species is actually a reference you know, saying, you know, where do we get these species? You know, how do we end up with all these different species? And basically, the thing is what I just said a second ago, is if we go back far enough, they're descended from common ancestors. And it comes, you know, you get all these different changes because of natural selection. So that's basically not talking about any particular species in that in that book. Now, it doesn't mean the beginnings of life and all that stuff, right? So it, it doesn't mean anything like that. Now Darwin never said that we descended, you know, that we that we came from from apes. You know, he never said that. This is pretty much what I just said. It's like, look. <laughs> Again, we go back far enough, we have a common ancestor because we are so similar compared to other species. And it's not a whole thing about survival of the fittest because this is, and you'll hear this again from me in a minute because Herbert Spencer is gonna come up again too, but survival of the fittest was not what Darwin said. This was something that a guy, a, a philosopher over in England said, Herbert Spencer. Okay, survival of the fittest, and that's going to have a whole different thing. So for Darwin, you're talking about variation between individuals. You've got natural selection based on differences in survival. And then which traits are going to be passed down? So again, if you, if you, um, if you don't have a lot of a science background, you're going to need to go back and kind of if you're interested in that, uh, in, in your spare time, because I know you have a ton of it, I'm just totally kidding because none of us do anymore. But, um, you know, Darwin is not going to say a lot of things you think he said. And he, you know, 
But the only way you're going to figure that out is by reading exactly what he wrote. Okay, so anyway, that's that's where we get things like that comic and so on. Now, the descent of man, when he talks about that, you know, he specifically talks about humans. And that, um, yeah, that makes some people really angry to put humans out there as just another, you know, another um, animal, basically. So, again, go back far enough. We're so common, have much, so much in common that we're going to have common ancestors. So, re you know, read that, take it for what it is. On slide 13, it, it's kind of a continuation. I went ahead and I had mentioned a little bit about Auguste Comte and um, sociology and everything. So now let's check out Sigmund Freud for just a minute. Now, Sigmund Freud is going to give us psychoanalysis and talk is a, a pretty, um, this is a, just a, a groundbreaking way of, of thinking of the way our, our brains work in ways that we don't even understand or we're not even aware of. So the way Freud describes things is, he says, okay, we have these these parts in our mind that we don't necessarily know exist and they're called the id the ego and the super ego i remember learning about this for the first time i i think in high school and i remember thinking wow this is some really far out stuff and it really kind of is but um it, it it's with freud you know i mean he's a lot of things that he said back in these days, we're going to see that, that we've got better theories and better ideas today. I mean, for example, um, when we talk about psychoanalysis, really he's saying that people just need to, to be honest and open and bring the thoughts that are unconscious, the ones they don't know, try to try to find those and bring them to light and to get rid of all these things that you have been hiding and repressing so you have words that come about that are that are used to describe it like you're having a cathartic experience you know very um very uh say a, a, a easy way for you to cure whatever it is things that you are holding on to from when you were a child and and the whole unconscious mind and and it's true Freud would have people you know kind of lay down on a couch and then he would sit behind them listening he's going to tell them about his dream you know tell they're going to tell him about their dreams and their childhood and you know it may take years to go through psychoanalysis but the thing that, um, that that's really interesting about that, see, is he's really using their dreams, and he has a lot of symbolism in dreams. He publishes a book in 1900 called The Interpretation of Dreams. Now, he sees a lot of things as being repressed sexuality. So there's a picture of Freud there, a little comic of Freud. He's holding a cigar, and... So Freud, in, you know, in the interpretation of dreams and, and so on, you're going to hear so many things that he believes to be phallic symbols. You know, if you're, if you're smoking a cigar or if someone's smoking a cigar, well, that's a sign of, of it's, it's a sign of, of a phallic symbol of some sort. And so maybe you're not having enough sex. Maybe you're having too much sex. Maybe you don't want sex. Maybe you're at whatever, you know, whatever. However, he would interpret that. You know, you went to, to visit uh, Washington, D.C., you saw the Washington Monument. Well, clearly that's a phallic symbol. So, yeah, sometimes, you know, there, there's a saying, sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, and that's where it came from. So he, he got a little bit out there, again, with a lot of his ideas. And then when we go back and we talk about the unconscious mind, and we talk about those three parts, this was the stuff that, as I said, I probably I learned in high school, and I was like, wow, this is so cool, but also 
I'm not sure exactly how he decided this was a good, you know, theory. All right, here's the thing. You have your 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 own um, personality, okay? He, he's going to come up with the idea of personality theory in sometime in the 1920s. And you're going to have your personality, he says, made up of three different parts, the id, ego, and superego, as I mentioned. And all of these things come at different parts of our lives. So they're not physical. They're not, you can't go into someone's brain and, and find the part that represents the id, for example. So they come at different parts in our lives. So the id is going to be our instincts when we're born. You know, why do we cry when we're hungry and we're uncomfortable? And it's that, that primitive part of our mind that's operating just on instinct, okay? So the ego, the ego is the reality, the realistic thing that is going to have to serve as kind of a, you know, kind of a, of a compromise, between the id, which just wants to act out its most base instincts, and the superego, which is really your conscience and your morality. So you've got over here the id, and the id is just, again, you know, wanting to uh, it, it comes, you know, it, it's it's there when, when you're young and, and so on. You're pretty much, I believe he said, born with that, like I said. But as you grow, you know, some people, your id's still going to come up and you're going to get uh, hidden memories, he said, or you're going to get different things that, that may, you, may, may um, make you want to act maybe aggressively. You're going to strike out at people, okay? So you have over here then... The superego, your conscience, is like, look, you know, you really shouldn't do that. You really shouldn't strike out at people. That, that's, that's not right. And then we have in the middle the ego. Again, realism. And it's got to try to figure out how to stop you from going completely off either deep end of instincts and, and just doing whatever your primitive you know, part of your brain tells you to do or being too scrupulous and being so moral that, that you have nothing but conscience and, and you end up with so much guilt that you feel like everything you do is wrong, right? So, so this is what's, again, it's really, it really uh, struck me a lot because he says that when you're a little kid, everything you want is going to just be what you, you can only see yourself. It's what you want. You, you don't understand that other people have feelings. You don't understand that everybody is not part of you, right? So the id has absolutely no logic and it's way back there somewhere in our unconscious mind, okay? Way deep buried down. So it's basically basically, basically, you're going to hear the id talked about as being the pleasure principle. And Freud wrote several papers on that and, and many different things in the 1920s about that. So the ego then again, the ego is going to be something that actually grew as you grew from, from your primitive id. And you're going to end up with, it, with the ego looking at realistic ways to satisfy your unconscious desires. Instead of going over there just because you're so furious and knocking somebody out, the ego's like, all right, wait. <laughs> okay, remember, the ego's the mediator. So the ego's over there working kind of, you know, looking at the super ego, which is very, well, of course I shouldn't do that. And the id is like, well, I'm going to go do it. So the ego is like, all right, how are we going to satisfy the demand of the id without going completely where we can't take up for ourselves at all in that particular 
um, circumstance. So the ego is going to have to consider our culture. It's going to have to consider people, the way that people will think of us if we behave a certain way or whatever. So the ego is really the one that is trying to prevent a lot of your stress in the world. The ego, though, is not looking at right and wrong. That's the super ego. Super ego is looking at, um, you know, the conscience and so on. So again, I, I get too much into that because I think it's it's just really cool and also very weird. Now, he also wrote another book that I wanted to mention. It's called The Future of an Illusion. And Future of an Illusion, he's talking about God as an illusion. And he says that people are, when, when we're um, at a certain stage in human development, we need a father figure that we can't see, that we, we presume is bigger than us and more powerful. But he says, as we grow as people, we will have to let go of that childish idea that we have a God or a father figure, someone above us. So that was another, that was another one of his, um, one of his famous books in the early 20th century. Now we get to some new new trends in philosophy. I mean, agnosticism was never a brand new thing in this time. I mean, agnosticism comes from the 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 word gnosis, you know, G-N-O-S-I-S, which means knowledge. If you put an A in front of that, it means just having no knowledge. So you could be agnostic about anything, but it's usually in reference to God. So if you're agnostic, it means you have no knowledge that there's a God. That's simply, well, it, it's not what people used to say. I used to hear people say, well, if you're agnostic, you're on the fence about God. Whether an, you know, an atheist is saying there is no God, but agnostic is on the fence. Well, uh, really, agnosticism is a very honest approach that a lot of people will say, look, you know, they'll say, I don't know. I have not had any knowledge firsthand of God, but if I have knowledge, then I'll believe in God. So agnosticism is something that is uh, starting to be more talked about openly during the Nobel Epoch, as well as nihilism. Nihilism is a philosophical argument that says, you know, nothing is important, okay? I mean, a lot of times we, we talk about people having an existential crisis. Basically, why am I here? What's my purpose? So nihilism, a lot of times, I mean, you're going to be unconcerned with religion, morality, ethics, that nothing really has any objective reason for being here. There's no... There's no value to anything, really, okay? So you can have all sorts of, of um, different nihilist-type beliefs. I mean, basically, you can have skepticism. But if you were, if you were to take it down to its bare bones, you're going to see that if you took it too far, you know, a nihilist would believe in nothing, which is... You know, not not realistically what most of the nihilist philosophers and writers are going to present. Okay, they're not gonna they're not gonna have quite such an extreme, but they are gonna have a lot of skepticism, and they are going to actually um, they are gonna actually question whether or not the traditional things that make up a culture are important and why are they important and they come to the ideas that they're important because someone gave them that kind of importance so nihilism um is a is a really more it, it's a much more complicated thing than that i encourage you to read about it if you're at all interested in it and then we get to nietzsche now it is it is pronounced nietzsche not nietzsche i've had a lot of um a lot of, of people who are from Germany, lots of, of students and other people, friends I've known, 
took German through high school and college, but it's um, actually supposed to be pronounced Nietzsche according to all the German people. So Friedrich Nietzsche, I never pretended I could have a German accent. I'll tell you guys that a thousand times. But um, Friedrich, Nie Friedrich, or Friedrich Nietzsche is quite the philosopher. And I have to admit, I like to read him. I, I think he's very... Um, he, he, he twists your brain a little bit. And if you read any of his books, um, you know, any of his writings, they are just, you're going to have to stop and you're going to have to think about what you read. And then you're going to have to, to digest it for a while and try to figure out what in the world is this man talking about. So Nietzsche is going to have quite a few writings, and some of them were written before, well, he was actually the last, I think it was 10 or 11 years of his life, he's going to be institutionalized for, for mental health, okay? So some of the things that were published by Nietzsche were actually put, in, put together by his sister. She took fragments and pieces of things that she found that he had written and she put them together. So some of them are a lot less coherent than you might want them to be. But I will tell you as someone who, again, I actually, I, I like to read his works. I think he's just fascinating and he, he makes me think. I, I have a t-shirt um, with a quote from Nietzsche on it. But He's, you know, he's quite, um, quite difficult to read and difficult to understand because partially he was indeed going mad or, or you know, losing, um, you know, his, his mental health. And then his sister takes the pieces of what he had left and puts some of that together. Now, the book that I have on there, that the book that I have mentioned on there is Thus Spake Zarathustra, or Thus Spoke Zarathustra. And this is a, I think, maybe one of the most accessible books by Nietzsche. I'm not sure if um, if you would agree with that or not. But it basically has the character Zarathustra, which is based on a an old, um, you know, an old Persian um, prophet. But anyway, you have Zarathustra, coming down from the mountains. He's been up there for a long time, and he wants to come down and teach people about something that Nietzsche calls the Ubermensch, okay? German, Uber, you know, over, like Uber, like the driving thing, right? Ubermensch, okay, or Ubermenschen. And when we get to Hitler, you're going to hear that term again. Or it can be, it can be literally translated to over man. And so anyway, he comes down, and people just really, as, as Zarathustra is trying to connect with these people, they don't really care about what he's talking about. They're, they're just not all that interested. And so Zarathustra is really worried for the people, and, and he can't really understand why they're not interested in his revelation. So, yeah, it goes on and on and on. And you see that um, throughout that book, again, you're, you're going to find Nietzsche address things. You're going to have him address uh, things like, well, nationalism, which is something that uh, that Hitler is going to eventually embrace. He, he's going to love Nietzsche, who, who's German, and the idea of nationalism, which we've talked about, you know, my nation right or wrong, he, he's going he's gonna to mention nationalism, and he's going to talk about the um, the Ubermensch or the the Superman the Overman that will conquer the world and and Hitler's going to love that idea so anyway you have have that idea and that again I, and as as complicated as that is I still think that's probably one of the most accessible of Nietzsche's writings now you also have on here. And um, besides the Ubermensch, the Overman, the Superman, you also have the will to power. Now, the will to power is really complicated. And let me try to make that a little bit 
um, less complicated because what Nietzsche is saying with the will to power, he's saying that this is basically what, um, what everything is based on, the will to power. So the way that you can understand the will to power, he says, is that we're basically everything we do is an attempt to control other people. In one way or the other, it, it's always us trying to control someone else. Whether I give a command, whether I say, hey, go open the window or whatever, or if I bring you roses, he says that my attempt is still to assert my, you know, my um, needs and wants into and onto others. So we're going to put the, the authority of what we want above everyone else's whatever their needs and wants are. So again, it, 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 that can, you know, just from what I told you, that can make you sit and ponder for days if you were to take the time. Um, but anyway, that was, that was one of his most famous um, ideas there, was the will to power. Okay, so also, again, with the philosophy and religion, you've got the modernist versus the fundamentalist in Christianity. And the modernist want to embrace new things such as going away from a literal interpretation of the Bible. And fundamentalists are, are going to be more concerned with sticking to the basics, and they're going to believe that the Bible is literally, you know, word for word going to be true. And they're not going to allow, basically the fundamentalists are not going to allow for any updates due to science or, or scientific uh, discoveries or whatever. To call your attention to the women's movement over in Great Britain. Great Britain's going to have an easier time getting women to mobilize than some of the other places where women have not been working for their rights maybe as, as long or as strongly as they had in Great Britain. But we have a couple of women I want you to know. You have Millicent Fawcett, and she's going to be the one who is going to form the National Union of Women's or Women's Suffrage Societies in 1890. So Millicent Fawcett brings together all these different groups under this one banner of the NUWSS, and she is going to believe in nonviolent protest and, and working through the legal system to get women the right to vote. And again, this is Great Britain. Then you have Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters. They're going to form the Women's Social and Political Union in 1903 because Millicent Fawcett and her, you know, working through the legal system is not going to work that well. So Emily Pankhurst and her, her daughters and her followers, they believe in doing things that are a little bit more outlandish, like they'll chain themselves to places and they'll go in and, and disrupt parliament and they'll go on hunger strikes and, and really try to get some publicity for woman suffrage. So I just wanted to, to make sure you know those two and, and kind of know the difference in who they are and the way they were working toward the same goal. Well, we have to hit the politics. I mean, we have to. It's, you know, it's history and we're going to have to hit the politics. But what we see here is we're going to look at Germany for a minute here in La Belle Epoque. And we have William I, King uh, William I, who had come in in 1861 after he had been in um, that position sort of as a regent from 1858 to 1861 for his brother who passed away in, in 1861. And so William I is going to become Kaiser, remember, at the end of the Franco-Prussian Wars. William had been King of Prussia. But after the three wars of German unification, you're going to see that Prussia basically is going to still be the dominant force all the way through German unification and then after Germany is unified. And so William I, king of Prussia, becomes, you know, Kaiser or Caesar or emperor. William I, when he is crowned, you know, palace of Versailles in France, but he's going to become Kaiser. 
and he's going to become Kaiser of now the unified Germany. Now remember, Bismarck, Otto von Bismarck, his chancellor's prime minister, who he had put in in 1862, these two guys, they, they had very similar ideas, and Bismarck had built up the military and, and all sorts of things and, and had basically been the architect of German unification. So Bismarck is going to win every war he fights, right? Because he's not going to go to war. I told you this on another slide. He's not going to go to war unless he knows he can win. Well, Bismarck's going to lose two things, okay? One of those, and these are not, these are not um, physical battles, okay? These are, are, are cultural battles, which is actually what cultural comp, cultural comp for, cult, I'm sorry, my German, culture comp means. It means, you know, cultural struggle, okay? Cultural struggle. And the, the things that he's going to lose are not, you know, wars with, with the military. It's going to be, for example, the culture comp. Okay, so what happens is Bismarck is uh, in Germany where you saw the beginnings of Protestantism as Martin Luther, who, you know, was, was German, broke away from the Catholic Church back during the Reformation and you have the whole story of Martin Luther nailing 90, 95 theses to the door of Wittenberg Chapel and so on. And um, Bismarck is going to have the idea that the Catholics kind of are not welcome in Germany. You know, we're a, we're a Protestant country. We, we need to kind of get rid of these Catholics. And so Bismarck is going to go on this campaign to run the Catholics out of Germany. So among other things, Bismarck is going to start, it, it's gonna um, it, it's gonna present itself in many ways as he's gonna actually try to forbid the Jesuits. The Jesuits actually uh, were a, and are, um, I believe a religious order of the Catholic Church and they're they're going to be, each one of the orders, you know, different religious orders in the Catholic Church, they have different things that they do. For example, the Dominicans are known for teaching, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. But um, anyway, the Jesuits, uh, this is going to be a group that Bismarck is going to attack, and they're going to start in a lot of European countries, not just Bismarck, but Bismarck's right in the middle of all this, banning and restricting a lot of the Jesuit activities. And that's gonna, you know, that's gonna lead to other prohibitions of Catholic, you know, schools. They're gonna want to close a lot of the Catholic schools and all sorts of things. And again, Germany was very heavily um, Protestant. It was, it was more than half of the population, I know that was Protestant over in, in you know, the, the new German empire. And um, the, the idea for Bismarck to try to get the Catholics out of Germany was a really bad thing because it backfires. And as Bismarck is attacking the Catholic church through this cultural war, it causes the Catholics to come together even more strongly as sometimes happens and they are going to form the German you know Catholic Center Party okay and it's going to be formed in 1870 and it's going to be powerful because they know they're fighting for their right to really exist in Germany and Bismarck is going to lose this fight So Bismarck, you know, he, he's going to make a lot of mistakes. He, he believes that in order for, you know, this new German empire to be strong, he's going to have to try to unify the people. And again, that, that's going to be either having the Catholics leave Germany or go underground or convert or something. So his reforms are going to give way to this, this whole culture comp. And the way that he ends up losing 
this culture war was, as I said, he kept attacking the, um, the Catholic Church and they had, the, the church had lost a lot of, of power, but it had united the individual Catholics. And when they formed the center party, then Bismarck's gonna lose the support of a lot of his allies. And he's gonna realize that he needed to somehow make peace with the Catholic Center Party because they were getting a lot of power in politics. So, I mean, you're gonna have all sorts of, of dramatic things happening back then. There was an attempt by um, someone to assassinate Bismarck in some time in the 1870s, and that just made Bismarck get even tighter. So anyway, it's gonna, it's gonna be just a big old mess and Bismarck is gonna lose that. This is one thing out of the two things that he lost. He lost the culture comp because he was unable to get rid of the Catholic influence in the empire of Germany. I told you, I told you Bismarck lost two things and both of those are domestic. Both of these are are things that, as I said, did not involve actual military, did not involve actual war. The first was the cultural conf, or the culture conf with the Catholic Church, and the second one is socialism. Okay, so he's going to be the first to use socialism to fight socialism. Okay, that that's interesting. We're gonna we're gonna do what now exactly? Use socialism to fight socialism. What he finds out is that there was the Socialist Party coming up in Germany, and the Socialists were offering a lot of things that sounded really good to people, okay? And Bismarck knew that, that politically that would be really bad for him. So he decides to embrace some of the very things that the Socialists are offering and offer it from his own you know, power of position, you know, power and position as the chancellor of the state. So basically, we had some in the, in the late, um, you know, 1800s, I, I, well, I mean, obviously it's Bismarck. I think it was the late, maybe the late 1870s and 1880s. We're going to have some of these parties that were rising up like the Social Democratic Party in Germany. And you're gonna have um, the National Liberal Party and you're gonna have others. And they're, they're actually out there really talking about Marxist ideas. And Bismarck decided that in order to stop people from going over and joining those parties, that he would get, he, well, he, here's the basic idea. He would get the gist of what they, they were saying, and he would put it down to a very simplified form. In other words, he's, he's gonna take their ideas, and instead of going as far as the socialist wanted to go, he would offer a watered down version of it. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense because he's trying to he's trying to fight socialism by offering a lesser version of socialism. So again, what um, what he does, uh, you know, the things that that the Social Democrat Party, for example, and and the Center Party and some of them. What they talked about are basically the things that he puts into practice. I mean, he's going to end up getting things in like health insurance, okay? Now, the health insurance is going to be provided for German workers, okay? You're going to have an old age and disability insurance program, and the way he's going to pay for that is, is putting a tax on workers. And again, having the government provide these sort of things in the 1800s, this was not 
your um this was not your average thing okay so the old age pension it's kind of it's way ahead really it's way ahead of social security in the united states because social security the social security act in the united states is not until 1935 and social security was never meant to really to, to be given to, to to everybody it wasn't it wasn't meant to be collected by everybody because the life expectancy was you know going to be say 62 or something or well let's say if if the life expectancy was 62 um which it wasn't they would say well you can collect your your uh social security when you're 70 or or whatever so in other words the social security um act in 1935 in the united states actually was not meant to to be the way it is today and what's happened is our life expectancy keeps going up now back sometime here in bismarck's day your average german man had a life expectancy of about 45. now that's that's not all that crazy sounding as it may sound to you because in 1900, a baby boy who was born in 1900 in the United States had an average life expectancy of 47. So part of that is because, you know, there was, there was still the high rate of babies dying, and that was figured in. When you, you take it out, you know, and you, you adjust for demographics, it's a little bit different. But in other words, you're going to have, in Bismarck's plan, the old age pension is going to be payable when you're 70. And again, as I said, the life expectancy is going to be 45. So see, that's, you know, we, we have something similar going on to a lesser degree with the Social Security Act. So also, you know, injured workmen's, pen, you know, injured uh, workmen's pensions, things like, you know, workmen's comp, they're going to put that in. Now, Kaiser Wilhelm II, William II, is going to come in, his reign is going to start in 1888, and he is young. He's, I believe he's about 26 years old when he comes into power, and he just, he, he can't compete with Bismarck, and he's so incredibly either, I mean, I think from what I understand of William II, he goes between being starstruck by Bismarck, who is larger than life and the hero that unified Germany, and his jealousy and his ambition, he knows he can't compete. So he basically forces Bismarck to resign in 1890. And that's going to cause a lot of trouble for Germany because Bismarck, and actually for Europe, because Bismarck had worked this kind of magical web of diplomacy that people had str have struggled for years to figure out and, and sometimes some of the things that he had done behind the scenes we still don't know so uh, forcing Bismarck out was really not the best way for William II to gain um, a good reputation but that's not the only thing William II is going to make many mistakes regarding as you'll see as we continue on in Germany later at a different time. Here's what I kind of just said on this slide. I just have a picture of Bismarck there in his full Prussian hat and everything. But, um, or is that a helmet? Yeah, I guess it's called a helmet. But anyway, again, he had done so many things that were that were kept quiet and, and he had prevented almost in some ways we we can argue that he he may have prevented a huge war in addition you know the concert of europe of course was working but bismarck as he was dealing with all these different heads of state he was he was he was like i said a minute ago he was kind of weaving this very complex spider web of how everything fits together. And one thing that he did 
while he was in office was he always kept the French and the Russians from uniting. That's going to be important later because if you look at a map, you're going to see that the French are on the western side of Germany, the Russians are on the eastern side of Germany, and if France and Russia become allies, that can't go well for Germany. Bismarck knew that. So keep that in mind because that's going to happen in World War I. We're going to see exactly what he didn't want to happen in that case. Let's jump over to Russia for just a minute. In Russia, um, we have Tsar Alexander II, who's going to come into power in 1855. Remember, after Nicholas I dies during the Crimean War, Nicholas, um, upon his death, you know, Alexander comes in, and pretty soon he, he goes for peace in the Crimean War. So Alexander II is going to be a reluctant reformer, is what I've always called him, and he's going to do a lot of good for Russia in many ways. He's going to start to bring Russia more into the industrial world. He's going to transform it in a way that they're better able to participate in the Western European world. Now, Alexander II is going to be assassinated in 1881 by anarchists. We mentioned anarchists at the very beginning of this. So, that's something I want you to, to remember about Alexander II is uh, he is going to help Russia in many ways, but also that he was one of those world leaders assassinated by the anarchist movement. Here's a couple pictures I thought, you know, I, I love pictures. I don't know if any of you do. I, I do. I always love pictures. But here we have the successor. Alexander III, and Alexander III was a, a very, um, you know, he, he was a guy that, that was looking backward to the grand old days of absolutist rule. He wanted to be a, an absolutist, but in order to do that in, you know, the more modern times here in the 1800s, you're going to have to actually be very controlling. Now, again, Louis XIV and the other absolutists we talked about, of course, they, they have that, you know, again, that, that controlling aspect. But Alexander III is going to just absolutely micromanage everything. He's going to be a guy that, um, that people really don't trust. They don't really like him. And when, he, when he's gone, we're going to end up with Nicholas II. And Nicholas... Nicholas II is going to be the last czar of Russia, the last, you know, emperor of Russia. One of the four empires that falls in World War I is the Russian Empire. Okay, he's also the last Romanov. And he's going to reign from 1894 to 1917 when Russia has the revolution and overthrows the czar, you know, ends up uh, killing he and his family and putting in a new government. I really want you to know about Russia as far as, as this era and so on is the revolution of 1905, which is really a precursor to the revolution that would come about in 1917, 1918, that actually will be when Nicholas I, and, or I'm sorry, Nicholas II and his family are, you know, slaughtered basically. But we have this event called Bloody Sunday. We have a priest, Father Gepon, who leads a group of workers up to the czar's, I believe it was his winter palace, and they're out there peacefully protesting because they want better conditions for the workers. And they're, they're literally singing, God save the king, and they are protesting peacefully. And then it goes wrong. There's a great movie called Nicholas and Alexander. It's based on the books, you know, a, a, a history book by Robert Massey called um, Nicholas and Alexandria. And you're going to see a great representation of the Bloody Sunday event, the, the, the you know, what, what it entails in that movie. 
So, um, what goes on here in January of 1905 is actually, I mean, quite depressing. You can have a lot of people there, as I said, I mean, literally singing God Save the King. And the, the crowd believed for the most part, that if the czar knew of their concerns, the working conditions and everything, if he knew that he would help them. Okay, they had great faith in the czar in, in, in most cases. So what they didn't know was that the czar was not there. Okay, czar was not there at the Winter Palace. So we have some of the guards, some of the czar's guards out there, and these, these units of the, um, the Imperial Guard are actually watching this protest. And it is peaceful. And we're not sure how many people were there protesting. I mean, different numbers have been bandied about all this time. But we know that the military are going to have at least, I mean, the, the minimum that I've read about the military having there was more than 8,000. So the thing was, they were going to try to halt these people before they got up close to the palace. But see, what happens is you're going to have a lot of, of individuals in the guard or, or some of the military forces and so on that have come to help out, you're going to have a lot of them really confused because, I mean, this is led by a priest. And so there's a lot of icons and religious uh, imagery. And so a lot of the army officers are like, wait, wait a minute, what are they doing? This is a religious thing. And so some of the, some of the people in the military said, well, you know, it's okay. You can continue. And some of the others said, no, you must disperse. You must go back. So it's confusion. So the, the people, the protesters continue to go forward. And some of the military turn on the people who have, some of the marchers had been told they could continue. So we're going to have a shooting sometime that morning. And... At that point in time, you're going to see that about 40 people are going to be killed. Now, Father Gapon was not injured. And Father Gapon is going to be so destroyed after all of this. I mean, we don't know exactly how many people were killed that day. We think it was around 100. We have, we have other figures from other, you know, other sources as but we, we think it may have been around 100 and maybe a little bit higher. I mean, you're going to have the people who were very much critics of the, of the emperor. They're going to say, oh, there were at least, you know, three or 4,000 people killed. Yeah, you know, don't know exactly. We really don't know because it wasn't all from the from the shots and everything. It was the, the chaos that broke out. So Nicholas II, he, he was sad about this. And, and when he heard of it, you know, he, he was very upset. He wasn't there. He didn't tell the troops to fire on them. And anyway, um, it, it was just a mess. So what we saw was that basically... Father Gepon leaves Russia and he takes off and, and just, he's so disheartened from all of this. My, one of my favorite authors that I mentioned before, uh, the Russian Tolstoy, Leo, Leo Tolstoy is going to be really, he's going to be influenced a lot by the 1905, um, revolution. And again, this is a precursor to the big revolution that's coming in 1917, 1918. So what we have is that Bloody, Su Bloody Sunday, as they call it, is going to start a bunch of workers' strikes all throughout Russia. You're going to have, we don't know exactly how many people that go on strike in Russia, 
And so Nicholas II decides that he's going to help give the people a voice. Now, basically, it's to keep them from striking and from causing violence, okay? So he decides that he's going to give them a voice. And he is forced to pretty much, you know, by all of this, to um, the October Manifesto, which creates the first Duma, which is Parliament. So he's giving the people the illusion that they're going to have power instead of an autocratic leadership through the person of Nicholas II. Well, the truth is, you know, you can read in your textbook if you want to, but the truth is he really never allows the, the parliament to meet. He, he finds an excuse and, and it, never, it never happens. So again, this is 1905 and the Russian people are going to continue to be angry for the next 12 years until finally the time comes for the successful Russian Revolution. So the Dreyfus Affair, I'd like for you to maybe look in your book a little bit about that, but the main thing about the Dreyfus Affair is you have a, um, a Jewish man in France who is going to be accused of selling secrets to the Germans, and it turns out to be an incredibly anti-Semitic affair, you know, case that, that's, um, you know, there's very little evidence of anything, that he's done anything wrong, and it's going to be put out in the newspapers, and, and you're going to have, um, you're going to have a judge who is, is, openly bigoted, and, and the Dreyfus Affair is going to be terrible. So basically, it's a case of anti-Semitism. They're going to send him off to a terrible prison, and it's going to take a long time, years, for uh, Dreyfus to be able to be released and eventually to get his name cleared. So the Dreyfus Affair looks to the world like France has a problem with anti-Semitism. France is exhibiting, you know, hatred toward the Jews. Now, Austria-Hungary had become a dual monarchy. The two countries of Austria and Hungary had come together under um, what's called sometimes the compromise, and I can't pronounce it in German for you, or I would try to spell it for you, but anyway, it's the, the compromise. And we have Franz Joseph over there, the guy with the you know, what are those, like mutton chop, uh, not sideburns, but it's a beard, and so I don't know what he's got. Anyway, that guy down there, um, Emperor Franz Joseph. So he's actually considered to be the Emperor of Austria, but the King of Hungary, as far as that. It was a whole thing. But this is going to be, the Austro-Hungarian Empire is going to be one of the four empires also that falls during World War One. There's going to be four empires. I already told you the Russians are going to fall, and I've already told you the Austro-Hungarian Empire is going to fall, and I don't think I told you, but the German Empire is going to fall, and I don't, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't tell you that the Ottoman Empire is finally going to fall. The Ottoman Empire had been weakening for 400 years, or well, for a couple hundred years at least, but yeah, those are the four that are going to fall during World War One. This slide really doesn't bear much mentioning because you're going to see it again very similar. When we start talking about World War I, we're going to talk about the four major causes of World War I, and one of those is imperialism. So this is happening here toward the end of La Belle Epoque. You've got the European countries going and carving up Africa, and you can see different regions. and I have actually a better, a, a little bit clearer map where you can see the two independent countries a little bit better that remained by 1914. But um, this is where we're going to start when we start with World War I, is basically with a very similar slide to that. So that ends La Belle Epoque.